Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another edition of Revisiting, where I look back on one particular album. And for this instalment, we're going to look at Year of the Cat by Al Stewart. And there we go, front and back cover. This one is a gatefold. So yeah, this album I discovered in the early 90s and I discovered it via a radio show here in England. Whispering Bob Harris at the time had a Radio 1 show and he played all kinds of music, old music and new stuff. One night I was lying in bed and he played this song called Year of the Cat by Old Stewart. I'd never heard of it, never heard of Al Stewart either. The album had come out quite a few years before, back in the 1970s. But I was I was really, really taken with this song. It definitely ticked all my musical boxes, a kind of soft rock, British pop kind of sound, lots of different instruments on display. You had saxophone, you had electric piano, guitars, strings, and this very enigmatic lyric and uh, sung by Al Stewart in this um, very unaffected voice, just, just you know there's no rock star posturing in his voice at all it's very undemonstrative and um the song is basically it's yeah. an account of of a guy's encounter with a glamorous woman who picks him up in a street bazaar as part of a tourist encounter in a in a foreign land and she uh she sweeps him off for a one night stand and then um dumps him in the morning essentially but um as usual for Al Stewart you know he tells it in this in this very enigmatic cryptic kind of style and um Al Stewart was a fascinating artist really he started out as part of the British folk revival really on the circuit in London playing alongside people like Bert Janschke and um, Nick Drake all those people he had a long attempt to make it a long string of albums he'd been signed to CBS for a long time and uh, this was his first album with RCA and uh, essentially it made him a star you know overnight pretty much it was produced by Alan Parsons who you know, clearly he'd worked with the Beatles. He was a rising star of British production. And I think um, I think Alan Parsons had spotted something in Al Stewart's style, which could maybe be turned to a more commercial kind of sound. Because Al Stewart's records, they hadn't they hadn't really been what you might describe as, as pop music or even soft rock. It was definitely a folk style that he developed. He'd started writing, or he had been writing these very long... Uh, long format songs about historical characters, extremely influenced by Bob Dylan. So he had that kind of, um, you know, he'd mastered that long form. You know, think of songs like Visions of Joanna by Bob Dylan. Al Stewart was definitely in that tradition, writing songs with lots of verses, lots of complex lyrics, interlocking musical parts, lots of imagery and quite a lot of um, cryptic, obscure stories whose meaning had to be teased out. Uh, the previous record to this one, he'd started to move away. That was um, Modern Times. He'd started to move away slightly from that historical thing, but not completely. But he was still writing what you might call novelistic songs. The songs all had stories, all had characters. Most of them are written in the second person, interestingly, where the singer is constantly addressing the listener as you all the time and placing you into the song. It's a trick he pulls off over and over again on this album. But um, I was just really taken by the title track. I loved it. And uh, it was nothing to do with anything that was happening at the time in music. I mean, this is 92, 93. I mean, it was the, it was the era of Kurt Cobain and God knows what else. But uh, as usual, I was always completely out of step with what was going on. So uh, I just loved it. Don't bother asking for explanation. She'll just tell you that she came. So it was his seventh album, released in January of 1976, produced and engineered by Alan Parsons, like I said, and um, the cover was by Colin Elgey, uh, who was from Hypnosis, and um, the cover basically shows, if you look here in the mirror, you can see um, a girl there who's... I think she's meant to be making up and getting herself ready, but she's clearly absolutely obsessed with cats. And in the foreground, pretty much everything that she has on her dressing table there has a has a cat theme or a cat emblem. You've got a cigarette packet with cats on and, um, you know, Egyptian artefacts, which are definitely feline, paws on the mirror there and even a real cat's tail there. And... Uh, you know, great, great artwork. Very, very 1970s. And um, there's that on the back looking very smart in a white suit. 
So, um, yeah, the record features uh, a band uh, which I think he'd been playing with already. I think Al Stewart did have a, a bit of a, a steady group around him. On this record, you've got Tim Renwick, and he was from the Cambridge scene. He'd worked a lot with um, with Pink Floyd over the years. Stuart Elliott on drums. Peter Wood was brought in on keyboards, and he does some fantastic keyboard work on this. Uh, George Ford on bass, and then wonderful string arrangements by Andrew Powell. And his string arrangements are very elegiac. They're very textured, beautiful strings, you know, violins, cellos. They give the sound a a symphonic depth really but it's not it's not prog rock or anything like that it's definitely more maybe think of the nick drake records maybe not quite the same as that but there's a subtlety to the arrangements which um is really is really beguiling actually and the songs are so absorbing it's, i mean it's an album that you can just lose yourself in so many different characters and situations very novelistic and the music is just beautiful it's uh it has a kind of dreamy sound it is soft rock but it has its own sound, this record, and um, I just do find it very beguiling. The opening track, Lord Grenville, uh, really sets the scene. It's about the Elizabethan sailor and explorer, Sir Richard Grenville, with a sweeping string arrangement, and it's definitely got a bit of a Floydian feel to it. Then on the border, um, this one, like quite a few of the other tracks on the record, has a bit of an Elton John feel, really. I think, obviously, it's it's in the keyboards. It's got a galloping piano. Bit of Spanish in this song. There's a maraca part that keeps coming back, and there's some beautiful Spanish guitar playing as well by Peter White, who contributes some great Spanish guitar textures to this song and a few of the tracks on the record as well. And this song, I mean, you know, again, going back to Al Stewart's uh, historic leanings, there's a verse about the Basque separatist movement and then one about the contemporaneous Rhodesian crisis. So he wasn't afraid to tackle quite demanding themes, really. In this record, he makes it slip down so easily. You're not um, you're not battered over the head by the words and they're not they're not foregrounded in a way that makes that forces you to listen to them his singing style is is very undemonstrative you can basically if you choose to you can kind of you can tune out the words really and just get lost in the in the instrumentation and in the arrangements but if you do want to click into the words you'll find a lot of very interesting narrative songwriting going on track number three is my favorite song on the record apart from the title track Midas Touch it's just a gorgeous soft mellow pop tune it's got Rose Piano in it, and um, it's got a very interesting lyric. It's very mythologized, and uh, it's basically, well, Al Stewart years later, he revealed that the inspiration for the song was, um, it came from him staying at the Hyatt Hotel in, in America at the same time as Led Zeppelin, and watching the way that Zeppelin and their and their road crew and their entourage were basically making constant use of the, you know, various female fans who were at the hotel and also some of the maids who worked at the hotel as well. So that's kind of what the song is about, but it's got some wonderful lyrical writing in it. He writes in this song, you've got your ticket and your hotel keys and your overnight bag at your feet. You're looking down on the tropical trees while the Spanish maids pick up the sheets. Conquistador in search of gold for all the jackdaw reasons, the Midas shadow that's so hard to please follows wherever you go. Wonderful rolling lyrical style. And he's able to draw on all these historical and mythological elements in order to tell his stories in uh, in a way which is really compelling and really interesting and quite quite unique, I think. Sand in Your Shoes, next track, has a beautiful piano part and an accordion. It's quite Dylan-esque, this one. And um, it's got this lovely refrain. He keeps singing goodbye to my lady of the island. This album was, was written and recorded not long after his marriage broke up. And there's this kind of vein of melancholy which runs through the songs, which apparently, you know, relates to this idea that he had just ended a long-term relationship, a long-term marriage. There's a kind of early evening melancholy which seeps into the songs. Just that kind of feeling you get where the light is fading outside, but you're, you know, you're sort of all right. You're in the house. You you know, you've lit the fire, you poured yourself a glass of wine and you're going to just basically try and find your uh, try and find your mental headspace and try and reach some kind of emotional equilibrium. His songs don't contain much drama. There's no kind of um, big highs and lows. Everything's all on a on a level, really. It's it's probably one reason why Al Stewart, even though he was he was quite big for a time in the mid 1970s, I don't think in the end his music had sufficient 
drama and, and drive really to sustain a big career I don't think he was that interested in that really I think he was more interested in telling stories and being quite subtle and um, you know I guess back in the 1970s being subtle was maybe not at the top of everyone's agenda but certainly that's a beautiful song as well and then the next track if it doesn't come naturally leave it this was actually inspired by a bad case of writer's block where he just couldn't think of a song and then this just this line popped into his head if it, if it doesn't come naturally leave it and uh, from that he he just he just developed this big long narrative song again and um always a mark of a songwriting genius really somebody who can turn writer's block into a fantastic song just by virtue of thinking of one line track six is flying sorcery which is a very sweet and melodic song the guitar in this really sounds like bb king has a very very sweet kind of sound now this song is an extended metaphor about airplanes losing each other in the fog uh, essentially as a metaphor for lovers who are being prized asunder by circumstances and uh, in this track he he name checks amy johnson who was the first woman to fly solo to australia al stewart's songs are full of all these references he'll just throw in a reference to somebody and it's almost like if you want to get interested in what he's singing about in his lyrics you do kind of have to have an encyclopedia sat next to you or google nowadays it would be wouldn't it i guess Track seven is broadway hotel this is a bit of a melancholy waltz with a very sad violin part it's got a harpsichord in it, that kind of period sound, which he had used before on quite a few of his records. Gives it a sort of, almost a kind of Elizabethan kind of flavour. One stage before, this is a really strange, unsettling song. It's about a performer who's doing some kind of show in a theatre, and he's basically looking out at the audience, and then he starts to notice that the place is full of ghosts, and it's the ghosts of all the different performers who've worked in this hotel in the past. Very original. He finds original things to write about, original little stories. And then the album ends with Year of the Cat, which has this wonderful dancing piano part and uh, just wonderful lyrics. On a morning from a Bogart movie in a country where they turn back time, you go strolling through the crowd like Peter Lorre, contemplating a crime. She comes out of the sun in a silk dress running like a watercolour in the rain. Don't bother asking for explanations. She'll just tell you that she came in the year of the cat. The music for this song originally was for a different song. He'd written a song about the British comedian Tony Hancock and how his life had ended or was maybe in the process of ending in, uh, in depression and despair, essentially. But for some reason, he ended up junking that lyric and he was inspired to write about the year of the cat, which is this very uh, enigmatic astrological thing. It was a big hit for him. It got to, I think it got to number five in in the US. It was a top five album in the US, got to number 31 in the UK, helped him hit the accelerator pad on his career. And he had a couple of years of being a big star in America. It's just a great album, one I'm so fond of, and uh, it will always hold a place in my heart. Leave me some comments. Let me know if you know the record or if it's a favourite of yours. And uh, I will see you in the next video. Take care. Bye for now. Yeah.